So in preparing for tonight's uh, event, I came across an article that was published in, so it happens by coincidence, our journal, Science. <laughs> so you know it's true, right? And the title really caught my attention. Here it, was, here it is, Humans Can Discriminate More Than One Trillion Olfactory Stimuli. That's trillion with a T. The researchers estimated that the average human being, whomever that might be, can distinguish between one trillion different odors, if not more. I don't know about you, but that was quite a revelation to me. Uh, at, up until that point in time, I thought that there were only three distinct odors that human beings could distinguish. Chocolate, dark chocolate, and semi-sweet chocolate. <laughs> But this was quite a shock and, qu and quite a revolution. But more seriously, I also learned in preparing for this that those who suffer from Alzheimer's, we often hear about how memory goes. Well, the first uh, brain system, if you will, to go happens to be the olfactory system, uh, the system that is used for smell and taste. <clears throat> so there's clearly much to learn tonight. And I want to tell you how we're going to proceed. I will first introduce our lead speaker, who will speak on the science of taste and smell. After that, I'll introduce our guest moderator, who will discuss her own work on the topic. And then she will invite our first speaker and the two other presenters to the stage. And she will moderate a discussion, if you will, at that time, among the four of them. That'll go on for about 15 or 20 minutes. And then I'll come up and lead a Q&A involving all of you. Um, as well as, by the way, people in our overflow room uh, who get here a little bit late, uh, which is just outside the uh, auditorium. Uh, our plan is to try to end as close to seven as possible so that we can start the second stage of this event. So let me say a few words about the second stage. We will have food and beverage on two floors for the second stage. This is the second floor, and then there is a floor down below which you can reach via the stairs just by going outside or there's an elevator that can take you down. Um, the floors are arranged according to four, four, if you will, uh, basic tastes, uh, which helps explain this. Uh, there'll be, uh, let's see, on the first floor we'll have sweet and sour, and on the second floor we're going to have salty and bitter. We've created these stations not because we just thought it was a good thing to do. It has a very practical implication as well, and that is sort of spreading out all of you so that you all don't end up trampling each other to get to one or the other. The food is good in all four stations, I promise. And after you have initially visited your assigned station, then you can go to any station that you'd like. And as a bonus, you can change Excuse me. You can switch with people. Look next to left to right and see if somebody wants to switch with you. Excuse me. And the, the fact that you got one or the other, please don't take that as a sign that we matched you and your, your personality with this. It has nothing to do with that. It's totally random, and that's just how it is, and that's what we want to do. Now, as a bonus during the reception, our guest speaker, Joan Marinin, who is an expert in fra fragrances, is going to host an interactive session in the Revell Conference Room, which is on this floor, and it's the first room to your right after you walk a little bit from the auditorium. And she's going to help, she's going to do an interactive session to help test your skills, if you will, at distinguishing among different aromas. And I know that our first speaker also has something planned, but I'll let him tell you about that. Okay, so I know you're all set f till seven, but at seven we need your cooperation in terms of moving out of the auditorium and taking advantage of what we have to offer. Okay, so with that in mind, excuse me a moment, I'll introduce our first speaker, who is Dr. Dr. Gary Beecham. He is at the, oh, that's not up there yet. Let me, let me do this. Hold on just a moment. There he is. He's at the Mornell Chemical Census Center, which is based in Philadelphia. 
And he also has, a, in addition to being involved in the management, he also is very much involved in research. Um, he's engaged in a number of things concerning taste and smell and other aspects of our senses. And he's going to sort of give us the overview talk on the science, if you will, of, of taste and smell. And after he's completed, I'll come back up and introduce our moderator, and we'll go from there in terms of a conversation. So I ask you to hold your questions until we get to the Q&A session a little bit later on. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Beecham. So I was interested in the next meeting on stress. Um, one of the things we're interested in is whether you can communicate stress by smell. And the way we stress people is to make them give speeches. <laughs> uh, and then we collect their t-shirts and uh, it really works. So here's a little outline of what I hope, hope to be able to talk about in the next 25 minutes or so. First of all, a little, little uh, uh, sales pitch for Monell, uh, then talk about the importance of the flavor senses, smell and taste, uh, some of the basic neuroscience, but I have to tell you this is going to be neuroscience light um, because I'm not going to get very deeply into the, certainly the central processing of smell and taste information. And then I, I want to talk about individual differences and how we're all different in the way we smell and taste things, and I'm going to give you three examples of that, so there's just little snippets of stories uh, about bitter taste, about an odor that is an interesting one, and about flavor. And actually, for each of these three things, I have some demonstrations uh, which are near the jelly beans somewhere down in the hall. Uh, and wh when I come to them, I'll, I'll mention them, and then, then you'll be able to, uh, to exp experience them if you want. So, uh, so Monell is a re basic research institute, the only one in the world uh, that is exclusively devoted to the mechanisms and functions of the, of the senses of smell and taste. It's located in Philadelphia um, on the edge of the University of Pennsylvania campus. Um, we were established in 1968, uh, and our mission is to improve the quality of human life through discoveries arising from ba basic and clinical chemosensory research. Um, we are a basic research institute. Our, our, our uh, product is, is papers and publications, and when I can ever get one in science, I'm very happy, and unfortunately, I haven't been able to talk Alan into sneaking one in for me recently. Uh, he can't do that, I know. Um, uh, but uh, we're a, a bit like a, uh, a university department, except we're independent, uh, and um, we have to raise all of our own funds. Uh, we're distinguished by the fact that we're a multidisciplinary place, and, and when you're studying the chemical senses, there's obviously chemistry involved, there's biology, uh, there's behavior, uh, and so all of those things together, uh, we're, we're, we have people that are interested in studying those, and as I said, we're located on the University of Pennsylvania campus. So here are, here's a cutaway, and we have um, the three chemical senses, and I'm only going to talk about two of them. Uh, I'm going to talk about taste, which for, for conscious taste perception, is localized in the oral cavity on the tongue particularly, but also in the palate, and even down as far as the throat. Then there's the olfactory sense, which is the receptors are way up here in, in the top of the nose, and there's two ways in which we experience uh, odors. One is sniffing, so it's through this way, so if we're sniffing a flower, it comes through. It's called orthonasal uh, olfaction. And the other, which is much more important for flavor, is the retronasal, and that is when you put food in your mouth, you swallow, and what, what that does is drives the odor up this way to the olfactory receptors. Um, and, and, and so you, you, people have a big, big problem discriminating between smell and taste. And in fact, we, we have a clinic where we have people that come in and say, I've lost my sense of taste. Almost never true. Uh, almost always what they've lost is their sense of smell, but they don't, they don't separate those two things. And in fact, the word taste in colloquial encompasses both smell and taste. And then the third chemical sense, the one I won't talk about, which is the sense of irritation, which is a, a skin sense throughout the whole body and it involves things like uh, hot peppers, uh, uh, menthol, um, CO2 carbonation, those things which are presumably there to, to warn us about danger, yet for reasons that we don't understand, half the people in the world refuse to eat unless they're, they're being subjected to a small, small level of pain. Uh, it's a very, <laughs> very interesting uh, observation. So if we think of these five senses, 
and, and think of what happens when you, we lose them. Obviously, we worry most about uh, vision and hearing, and, and even somebody as, as passionate about the chemical senses as I am have to admit that it's much more serious to lose your sense of, of, of vision or hearing than it is to lose your sense of uh, smell and taste. But if you think about health, uh, I argue that the health impact, uh, the chemical senses are much more important because these are the senses that drive excess consumption of sugar, salt, fat, and many other foods, the kinds of things that lead to uh, the, the diseases of excess. And uh, in terms of, of overall health uh, aspects, uh, understanding these senses and learning how to manipulate them is, is really, really important. So if we look at these two uh, chemical senses, start with taste. Um, basically, we believe, and, and this has been thought for uh, thousands of years, and I think it's true, that there are these basic tastes, uh, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, uh, that some are there in, in main to protect us from, from harming ourselves with poisons. Many, most bitter things are poison. Um, most uh, medicines are very bitter. Um, and the, the, the bitter sense is the plant telling you to stay away and you staying away because you don't want to get poisoned. And then there's the, the, the good side, the, the sweet uh, for recognizing uh, calories, salty for recognizing sodium, which you have to have. And then this uh, uh, more recently uh, identified taste, umami, which is presumably uh, an amino acid uh, sensor for detecting protein and amino acids. Uh, and so it's a relatively uh, um, small number of qualities. Um, if we have uh, smell, and you can see in the red thing, I, I, I'm off by an order of magnitude. Uh, whether there's trillions of odors, I'm not so sure. Uh, I, I know that paper well uh, that, that, that said that there were, and, and uh, uh, it, it is a controversial paper, but a very interesting one indeed. Um, we had him in our, uh, give a seminar on that just a week before that was published. But there are many, many, many odors, no question about that. And they serve a variety of functions, not just in food, for they serve warning and protection. They're involved in communication, sex pheromones and, and, and attractants and repellents. But they're also very, very important in food, and particularly for this retronasal uh, pathway. So here's my neuroscience. This is it. Um, so here's, here's a cutaway of a head. The taste uh, uh, is subserved by uh, three cranial nerves, uh, seven, nine, and 10. Uh, that go to the nucleus of the solitary tract, then up through the thalamus, uh, into, into the gustatory cortex, and then eventually to the orbitofrontal cortex. For smell, this smell is a very interesting one. It does not go through the thalamus. It's the only sensory system that doesn't. Uh, and therefore, this partly explains this miraculous power that smells have to bring back memories. When you, you know, walk into a place, for me, it's walking into some place, all of a sudden I get this smell and I'm transported. It's not that I'm reminded, it's I'm actually there. Where, it's my grandfather's garage. And I'm sure almost everybody has that, one of those kinds of things. Uh, but they're all different, they're all unique. Anyway, so the, the olfactory goes, uh, system goes there and also in the orbital front of the cortex. So this is, this is where flavor is put together. And this, and this, this is where we sort of get the confusion of, of smell and taste coming together. Um, now, what I was going to do is do a jelly bean demonstration here, but I was told I couldn't do it because uh, you don't eat here. So many of you know uh, this demonstration, but it, it is a remarkable, powerful one. And basically, what it shows is, is what role odors play in flavor perception. The, the, the trick is there's jelly beans downstairs. You can try it yourself, or you can try it with any food you have. Uh, just hold your nose really tightly, put a jelly bean or so, uh, some, some flavorful food in your mouth, uh, chew it up, think about what your experience is. The experience will be sweet, sour, salty, bitter, uh, umami, and you know, maybe a, a tingle or something like that. You let go of your nose, and all of a sudden, bang, it's strawberry. Uh, and and this, is, this is one of the most dramatic demonstrations of this role of the retronasal olfaction, because basically what you're doing is, uh, it's like holding the end of a hose. When you hold the end of the hose, the water can't go through. When you let go, the water goes through. So you're holding the end of the hose. When you let go, the air is coming up this way, and you're getting the smell. But you will perceive it as in your mouth. We're built so somehow we perceive that as, as something going on uh, in our oral cavity, when in fact it's going on way up here. So a little bit of, 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 of the uh, anatomy, at least, of, of uh, uh, smell and taste. And I'm going to start with taste, and this is the, the tongue. Uh, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, which has these papillae, uh, and these papillae uh, have uh, uh, receptor cells in them. 
this is what the papillae look like in cross section, and these little little um, uh, uh, taste um, taste buds are located here, and these taste buds then have taste receptor cells uh, in there that, that that express receptors. Well, that was fast. <laughs> Probably hit something wrong. That's where we were. So. Uh, this is the taste bud. It has these taste receptor cells, and each receptor cell is actually attuned to either sweet, sour, salty, or bitter. So we, 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 the, the anatomy tells us what, what our per percept tells us, that these things are separate uh, and distinct uh, uh, tastes. So the receptors themselves that are on these are of two sorts. They can be uh, G protein coupled receptors. These are the most common receptors in the brain that the receptors are involved in neurotransmission, brain, brain activity, uh, and it turns out both taste and smell. And then there's ion channels, which are also very, very important for m many kinds of neurotransmission. So we have food, it breaks down into chemicals that are, uh, in this particular case, in interact with tastes, taste receptors, and they can go one way or the other. Um, so the ion channel uh, that we've, several of us have recently discovered at Monell and elsewhere, that is responsible for, for tasting salt is a very interesting one. This is the epithelial sodium channel. It's the same channel that's in your kidneys, and it turns out that nature likes to reuse things. And so it looks as if, for salt taste, that the same channel, basically what it is, is the sodium is out here, so this is the outside, say in your saliva. The sodium ion itself breaks down, if you say put sodium chloride in your mouth, the, the sodium and the chloride separate. The sodium, which is positively charged, goes through this channel and inside the cell then, this causes uh, a, a nerve impulse to be sent to the brain saying this is salt. Uh, it turns out it's much more complicated than this, of course, uh, and looks as if there's multiple salt receptors. But the discovery of this is making a lot of people very interested in trying to find things like salt substitutes, salt enhancers, things of that sort that can help us reduce uh, uh, salt intake. Um, so sweet receptors and bitter receptors are, are these G protein coupled receptors, which just means that they're, they're these, these seven transmembrane receptors. Here's the outside, again, of the saliva. Here's the inside uh, of, of the taste receptor cell. This is the receptor itself. And th these are bitter receptors, and there's 25 of them in, uh, uh, in humans. And th then there are somewhat similar receptors uh, that re respond to sweet uh, and amino acid taste or, or, or umami taste. Uh, and uh, these receptors actually work in, in, in tandem, two together. <clears throat> so I want to talk now specifically about bitter receptors. So uh, unlike um, sweet or salty, w we have lots of bitter receptors. Humans have 25, some animals have none. Frogs, for God knows what reason, have 52 of them. Um, <laughs> but these presumably exist because so many different kinds of ch chemicals are bitter. Uh, many, many different things. And, and if you were to go out and walk in the woods, and I, 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 somebody caught me on this, so I have to tell you, don't do this. But if you did, and just pick up anything and put it in your mouth, <laughs> it will be bitter. Um, uh, nature is mostly bitter. And the, thing, the foods we have is, is you know, we've selected the bitter away. Um, so one of the most interesting observations was made many, many years ago now by Fox, uh, and he and, and a colleague that's written up here uh, were, were working with some uh, compound, and one of them could taste it. It was awful, awfully bitter. The other person said, I don't know what you're talking about. And that resulted in a, uh, the, the, I think there's something in the order of 30,000 papers on this particular topic now based on this single observation. And this is a great one because this happened to AAAS um, in 1938. Uh, and this is uh, Blakesley testing people uh, with, uh, at a AAAS event. Uh, and the data that he uh, uh, got there was, was published in a scientific article uh, showing that there's a genetic basis for this ability to detect this particular bitter compound. <clears throat> um, now, it turns out that, that some of you will be able to taste this compound, that's PTC or probe. Others of you won't. Uh, this is genetically determined based on, 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 on the genotype. Uh, but uh, th th it turns out that, that in all, all over the world, there, there are 
differences in, in people's ability to taste it. S uh, so some, uh, in some areas, most people are tasters. In other areas, most people are non-tasters. And it, it, is, it is found th throughout the world. And this, this sort of sh shows a, a map showing uh, the variety of different proportions of, of people in different, in different cultures that can taste it. Some, in some cultures, uh, three quarters of the people uh, are non-tasters, and in other cultures, uh, it's less than uh, 10%. And this is the, sort of the map of the world where those, those exist. <clears throat> now, th you are exposed to, to molecules like this all the time, uh, namely in vegetables. And so many, many vegetables have uh, compounds that are chemically similar and interact with the same receptor. So this is the receptor. It's called um, T2R38, not too uh, sexy title, but it, it's the PTC receptor. Uh, and basically, this is, this is again, the this, this seven transmembrane uh, uh, receptor. Outside is the saliva. Inside is the, the taste cell. Uh, the, the bitter compound interacts with uh, some of the right in here, probably. And uh, this receptor then uh, can show two, uh, two Main, uh, uh, main alleles. One, which is the taster allele, that is, it binds very well to these bitter compounds, and one is the non-taster, which doesn't bind uh, well at all. And so if you have two of these, you can really taste this stuff well. If you have two of these, you almost can't taste it at all. And that's shown in this, this figure here. This is the concentration of, the, of the, one of the pure compounds. This is the uh, perceived intensity by people's psychophysical test. So if you have two kinds, that, that is you're the PAV uh, genotype, then you'll, as you get more concentrated, it'll be smell stronger and stronger. This is the one that, does, that has two of the other kind, and this is the one in between, which is uh, one of one and one of the other. So one of my colleagues did a, did a study where he looked at a bunch of vegetables uh, with uh, related compounds in it, and basically what he found was that um, for those people that could taste, Again, this is the perceived intensity. This is how bitter the, these, these various vegetables are. And here's the vegetable all along here. Those that could taste this, this compound, for every one of these vegetables, they tasted it as much more bitter. And those that couldn't, uh, they tasted it as much less bitter. Um, it's, that's not true of all vegetables, because some vegetables don't have this same class of compounds in them. But it shows that there's a huge difference in the, that, that uh, George Bush Sr., who didn't like broccoli, Maybe he really couldn't, uh, uh, had this very, very strong ability to detect the bitterness and, 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 and didn't like it. One of the real puzzles, though, is um, you think about it, is if this, presumably, this re bitter receptor is there to protect you, then why are there non tasters? Wouldn't, during evolution, there be a selection for everybody to taste it if, 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 if for some reason you were supposed to avoid? Because these compounds, actually are anti-thyroid compounds. They, they, they are harmful if consumed in large amounts. So what maintains this, this, this bitter polymorphism? Um, and I don't think we know. One possibility is there's some other bitter compound that, that the non-tasters can taste and that maybe we just don't know what that compound is. Uh, that's possible. Uh, but another possibility is one that's very exciting to all of us in the field, and that is maybe we're looking at the wrong place. Um, it's like looking for the keys underneath the light. Because what we taste uh, uh, consciously is due, as I said, to bitter receptors in our oral cavity. But it turns out there's bitter receptors all sorts of other places. There's bitter receptors in your nose. There's bitter receptors in your lungs. There's bitter receptors in your sperm. Um, probably other places as well. What are they doing there? Well, they're doing some sort of protection there. And maybe there is where the non-taster has uh, s some sort of benefit. Um, so. We've recently been looking at bitter receptors here, and it's not that you can taste bitterness there. It's just the receptor is there, and what it appears to do, oops, what it appears to do is detect uh, bacterial products. So that if you have the taster allele, that is, if you're really good at tasting this class of bitter compounds, you're going to be much better at fighting off uh, um, nasal sinus disease, because those receptors also detect the products of the bacteria. And when they detect the products of the bacteria, what they do is they mount an attack against them. Uh, and so the tasters are also resistant, more resistant to uh, nasal sinus disease. Um, so that doesn't explain why we have non-tasters, but it, it does show you that, that, that there is uh, other pressures on this taste system, the, the conscious part, uh, which we are totally unaware of because we're not conscious of, of the bitter receptor activity in our nose. <clears throat> 
Now I want to talk about a similar kind of thing in the sense of smell. And that's uh, a compound called androsinone. But start with uh, olfaction a little bit. So this is an electron micrograph of your nose. Uh, um, if you were to look way up on top. Uh, these are uh, receptor cell neurons. Uh, and on these cilia here are, uh, are the receptors that allow uh, detection of those uh, uh, millions and billions or trillions of, of odors. And again, this is the same kind of thing, just another picture of this, this seven transmembrane uh, receptors, uh, uh, which, which was uh, discovered by uh, Buck and Axel in 1991. And that, that was the one of the most, that certainly is the most astounding discovery in the chemical senses ever made, because what they discovered was that, at least in mice, there were a thousand such receptors. And if you can imagine, mice have about 35,000 genes, they have a thousand of them devoted specifically to smell receptors. So that is, it, it's calculating from that and doing very complicated calculations, I must say, that this science paper came up with the estimate of a trillion different odors that could be detected. But uh, it is a remarkable number of receptors. Now, humans only have about 350 of them that function, but that's still a huge number, uh, much more than any other sensory system. So what's thought to be the way the system works is these are the, this is the, the drawing of what I just showed you. These are the cilia up here. There's receptors there. Uh, the neurons that are responding to odor are interesting because they are literally a piece of the brain that's sticking out here because they, they synapse uh, right in the brain. And so presumably what happens is when you have an odor, say this is a banana or fish, uh, that stimulates a set of these uh, that, that goes to specifically to individual ones of these glomeruli here which then send the message down the uh, lateral olfactory tract to the olfactory cortex, which we saw in the very early thing. And when it's a different odor, um, then you will get uh, a different set of these glomeruli uh, stimulating this. And when it's mixture of odors, then you can build up all these, these, these multiple uh, kinds of uh, potential uh, uh, odors. <clears throat> and like taste, each one of your receptor odors, each of you is different. Um, and so the, the average person uh, has about five unique alleles. Uh, for, I mean, each receptor has uh, about five unique alleles, which means that if there are 350 receptors times five, there's inc incredible diversity, and there's no one person that has the same olfactory sense in this room. Uh, some, of, some of the differences are probably small, some of them are big, but they are all different. <clears throat> Now, one of, the, one of the interesting odors, and one that we've been working with for a long time, but since before uh, Buck and Axel had identified the receptors, was a product of these guys. Uh, and it, it is a pig pheromone. It is um, something called androsinone. Basically, it comes in, particularly in the saliva of male pigs. And when they breathe on a female who is in heat, she will assume the lordosis position. And this is actually put in sprays and used for artificial insemination. It's a really, really foul odor to most people. Um, and this is the reason that you don't eat male pig meat. It's called boar taint. Um, uh, uh, I have a, a, a sample of it uh, down on my table there, and uh, you're, you're, you're welcome to, s to sniff it. Um, so there, we, we, we discovered that like this bitter compound, which I also have samples down there, uh, that if you tested people, uh, th th some people would say that smells awful. Uh, other people say, I don't know what you're talking about, there's nothing there. Uh, again, seemingly a genetic uh, trait, but to show that uh, the, the best, simplest way is to do twin studies, that is look at identical twins, which as you can see these are, uh, or um, fraternal twins. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the idea, of course, is that identical twins will behave identically, the fraternal twins will not, and this will uh, be good evidence that this is a genetic uh, trait. This is a little bit hard. Uh, figure to see, but once you understand it, uh, it, it is actually quite beautiful. Uh, I designed it, so I can say that. <laughs> no, no. Uh, uh. So along here we have people sensitivity. Uh, so this is uh, these these are, are are very sensitive people. No, these are insensitive people. These are very sensitive people along this axis here. Each dot represents um, uh, represents a person. Or in the case where there's only one dot here, represents two people. That is, that is two twins that are absolutely identical. So if we look at these two twins here, they're very different in their response on this side to androsinone. This is a control odor. You just ignore that. Um, and so the, the, the length of this line shows you how similar two twins are. And I think it takes no statistics to see that the identical twins are essentially identical. 
And in fact, if we test the same person twice, we get about that variation. Whereas the fraternal twins are very, very different. And so this is very strong evidence that there's a genetic uh, component to this. Um, so after Buck and Axel identified the olfactory receptors and, they, uh, and, and further progress was made in putting them into uh, 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 cell-based systems to, to, to look at, see how they work, uh, this, this particular receptor was identified as the likely one that was responsible for the individual differences between ability to smell and not to smell. Uh, and this was demonstrated uh, using, taking this receptor and putting it into a cell-based system, putting the odor over it, and showing that this, the, 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 the smeller uh, alleles uh, showed a very strong response, the non-smeller alleles showed a very weak response, and this was recapitulated in, in, in the individuals who had the smeller or the non-smeller gene. They, they had very different sensory experiences. So this strongly suggests that this particular receptor is in fact um, the one that accounts for the fact that uh, about half of you will be able to smell it and half of you won't. Um, but there's puzzles with this too. So we still don't know why there are non-smellers. Well, wh wh what, what is that about? What could be the benefit of, uh, of a non-smeller? Because it seems to be uh, consistent across the population. It doesn't go away, doesn't get more, doesn't get less. So we don't really know. Maybe there are other compounds as, as I spoke in, 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 in the bitterness thing. But there's also a possibility we're work working there in the wrong place. Um, there just a paper came out a day before yesterday uh, that, that, that found olfactory receptors in the brain. Um, so they're, they're probably also all over the place being used for other things and, and we really don't know uh, what they might be. But there's also some really interesting other aspects that are unexplained by this very simple genetic hypothesis. All of us in science, of course, want to have simple stories that really have a very clear-cut answer. And so this genetic, uh, um, this genetic basis for this difference uh, was published, I hate to say this here, in Nature. Um, uh, but uh, because it's so nice, but there's, it's, 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 it's not as nice as it seems. So here, here's a little, uh, here's a kind of experiment like they did at AAAS. This, this we have a science fair uh, uh, in, in Philadelphia every year, and this is an experiment uh, that's not really an experiment, but the data are so nice you almost publish it. So what, what happens here is people come along, we give them Andros known to smell. We, we just give them a bottle. And um, we give them, if they're adults, uh, a, green, a blue uh, Monel sticker. This is our logo here. See the nose and the mouth. Um, and if they're kids, we give them this, this uh, uh, mustard-colored one. And then if they can smell it, uh, they put it here on this side of this. This is a piece of cardboard, actually, a big piece of cardboard. So they put it on this side. If they can't smell it, they put it over here. Now, there too, it's pretty clear, you almost don't need statistics to see, that almost all kids can smell it. And um, that's certainly not true for adults. Now, if it's a simple genetic thing, what, what is that about? How could all kids smell it if, if, if some of those kids have to be of the genotype that, that presumably can't smell it? Very, very, very puzzling uh, to me. And then there's another one, and this is, um, this is also totally unexplained. So what we have here are people who all of whom could not smell the odor. And for, uh, for all these people, what we did is we gave them a, a little bottle with the odor in it. We said, take it home and sniff it a minute, uh, three times a day. And of course, for, people, for all these people, this is a really ridiculous thing because they were sniffing, there's nothing there. Um, then we measured uh, across uh, 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 about six weeks uh, their ability to smell it uh, using uh, uh, very rigorous uh, techniques. And what we found is about half the people developed the ability to smell. We induced the ability to smell this thing by exposing it to it over and over again. And um, this principle, uh, we don't understand how it works. Uh, again, it's not consistent with the idea that there's a simple genetic explanation for all of our differences there. But clearly, this, this can have some importance because people lose their sense of smell in a whole variety of ways. And this is maybe one technique that we could use to train people, sort of exercise their olfactory sense uh, to get better. This is a huge change, though. This is from not being able to smell it at all to actually being able to smell it quite clearly. <coughs> um, uh, finally, I want to talk about the, the third one, which is um, imprinting and flavor. How am I doing? OK, I'll go through this quickly. So um, this is a, a true experience one. And we've been interested for a long time in 
flavor, uh, uh, how children learn to like particular foods and flavors. Uh, this is a long history in, 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 the, in the animal work. And uh, what, we, what we found is that many flavors that mothers consume are, are transmitted via their amniotic fluid and their breast milk. Uh, and, and the infants not only uh, are exposed to these, they, they can detect them. And we know that from, a, from, from animal studies, but we also know that uh, from human studies. Um, we, we've shown that these kinds of flavors here are transmitted in human milk. A particularly salient one, just for interest, is, is, um, is this one. Uh, the, the breast milk of a woman who smokes cigarettes smells like a really, really well-used ashtray. It's really unbelievable. Very, very strong. And of course, there is good evidence that uh, infants uh, born to mothers who smoke are more likely to smoke later on. So uh, we did another study where we looked at uh, infants that were exposed, the mothers were exposed to carrot flavor uh, during pregnancy or during lactation or never. And um, I won't go over the data, but we very clearly showed that, that, that mothers uh, that, were, that, 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 that when the infants were tested when they were six months old, uh, and, um, uh, and they had, had no experience, no postnatal experience with carrot flavor, they showed a much stronger liking for carrots. Um, we've been using this model system, which is uh, this uh, pre-digested hy hydrolyzed casein formula, because it allows us to do real experimental studies with humans. And that's my third example out there. So I've got some of this formula out there. I haven't got a lot of it, but um, I, I will say this, I dare you to try it. <laughs> so here's, here's, the, here's the data we have on, on individual children. And basically what we're doing in this study is we're giving the children uh, five minutes to consume regular formula, and they're all formula-fed infants, and five minutes to, f uh, to consume this casein hydrolysate formula. And so if you look at this infant here, what this means is, 0.5 means that this particular infant consumed equal amounts of the hydrolysate formula and the regular formula. And what you can clearly see is if they're less than four months of, old, of age, they, they, they don't care one way or the other. But when they get older, they really hate this hydrolysate formula. Um, very, very profound change uh, developmentally during the first four or five months of life. We don't know what's happening there. It's a very interesting neuroscience question to know what, what is going on there. But this is, to me, almost the most dramatic example of a change because if they're fed this formula uh, and, and beginning here and keep, keep feeding it to them, they'll be out here uh, later. And I can show you that in this slide where infants that are fed the, the, this, this formula for, uh, for se seven, mo seven months show a very, very uh, strong response to it. They really like it a lot. But if they've not been fed it, they hate it. Um, now, that's easy for me to say, but it's even better to show you a movie. So this is a baby who's fed this horrible formula for seven months. Um, and this is, so she's hungry, um, and this is a really boring test because she's eating, she's drinking it. Next one I'm going to show you is another baby, same age, same level of hunger, but the difference is that that baby has never had this formula before in its life. Here he is. He's really hungry. <laughs> he keeps trying. <laughs> Very profound rejection. And, and um, so that's why I say I dare you to try it. So here we have some puzzles too. Uh, what sensory system is underlying this? Is it taste or is it smell? I believe it's smell. And there's been uh, recently a number of papers published suggesting that there is a class of olfactory receptors which are specially tuned to negative, uh, negative odors associated with breakdown, pr breakdown products of protein. Uh, it may be a protective sort of device to, to, uh, to ensure that, that you don't consume things that are, that are potentially dangerous. Um, and there's some interesting parallels, which I don't have time to talk about, but maybe we can later, uh, with some indigenous foods in the Arctic where people consume uh, sort of rotted uh, fish and uh, marine mammal uh, uh, pieces that rotted for six months, terrible smell, but if they've been exposed to them early in life, this is what they want. This is what they love. Um, 
but if they haven't, uh, they don't. So I want to end with, with a story, actually, and this is a story relevant to what I just said. This is uh, a story from Elizabeth Ross, and, and some of you may know her. She, she died you know, uh, about a decade ago, but she was a wonderful, she was the, the wife of uh, Paul Rosen, who's a colleague of mine, but she was a wonderful cookbook writer and uh, really a scholar. And she has this story, which is to me the, the ultimate story of uh, how cuisine and flavor and early experience are, are, are combined. So the, the Rosins, uh, after, uh, after Vietnam fell, uh, many, of, many Vietnamese were brought to uh, uh, Fort Indian Gap in Pennsylvania, and the Rosins uh, uh, offered to, to take uh, one of them in. And this is adopting a 14-year-old a, a, a kid. So it's a, it's a kid, never, can't speak English, uh, never been outside of Vietnam until he was brought to this place. Then he's dragged down to Philadelphia. Um, and the Rosins lived in this huge house uh, uh, on the main line. It's, just, it's, it's uh, you know, kind of like a house out of the storybook. And uh, uh, Liz Rosin uh, and Paul were waiting for, for him to be brought to them for the first time. They never even met him. Um, and so the kid describes this t t uh, to me. And he's, he's, he's coming in, walking up the steps. There's this massive house. And he's going to see the people who are going to be his parents he's never met before. Uh, th they ring the doorbell, opens the door. And wafting out is Vietnamese food uh, that Liz Rosin has prepared. And what he said was, all of a sudden, I knew everything would be OK. Um, and this, this is the essence, I think, of, of this early experience, the culture uh, of, of, of what food it is and what flavors are, and the importance of how this very early experience sets uh, and, and creates an emotional tone uh, that, that is uh, very, very profound and, and, and makes olfaction such a special sense. So uh, our belief about the development of flavors is there's this, this pathway between very early experience in amniotic fluid, in breast milk, then the foods of weaning, and flavors of adults. But we always come back to, to these flavors as the ones, I think, that, 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 that uh, bring us back to our childhood and, and are uh, so emotionally uh, arousing. So thank you very much. <laughs>Thank you, Dr. Beecham. I think we're off to a great start. Um, so let me um, just do this for a moment. OK, I want to introduce um, our next presenter, who will be moderating our uh, conversation that we're going to have about all the speakers in just a moment. That's Catherine Morgan. Um, she is a sommelier. I hope I pronounced that somewhat correctly, a wine professional. Uh, she's currently one of only 112 master sommeliers in, the, in North America, 17 of whom are women. And in 2010, the Washington City paper named her the best sommelier in Washington. So please join me in welcoming Catherine Morgan. Thank you for coming. Um, I, I'm going to say a, maybe a lot of the same things, but in a completely unscientific way. Um, but oddly enough, there is um, kind of a bit of overlap in how I perceive smell and taste um, and how those conducting all these fancy and fabulous experiments do. So um, that's the good news. Um, as um, Mark mentioned, I am a uh, local sommelier. I've uh, been working in DC restaurants in the wine trade since about 1999, um, so a very long time. And being a master sommelier, what that means is that I um, spent way too much time studying wine, really. But um, it means I passed an exam of which taste is a part, um, in which we have 25 minutes to describe um, on the, the nose and the palate and identify six wines. Um, by region, variety, and um, vintage, which is the hard part. Um, I didn't really start out trying to do that with my life. I was in college. I was maybe going to go to law school. I kind of caught the restaurant bug. Um, started working in restaurants because it was cash. It was easy cash. I got to stay out late, wake up late, 
go out every night and form this really fun bond with um, all these other restaurant workers. So um, I enjoyed doing that and realized that I really liked the part where I talked to guests about the wine lists and about what wine to order. But still, for a long time, I never thought to do that as a career. I never thought to do that because I was always under the impression that in order to be a sommelier, one had to be you know, maybe old and French, or have <laughs> extra taste buds, or be born under a lucky star, or have like, some calling, or have somebody deem you and your palate worthy of um, doing this professionally for a living. And I came to realize that, you know, that really <laughs> isn't the case. And especially actually listening to this lecture, it may be quite the opposite. I love bitter flavors. Like the, I can recognize that they're intensely bitter flavors, but I love them. And I hate the smell of vanilla. So, I mean, according to all of this research, it, my palate may be very poor. Indeed, um, yet I have been able to train it um, with years of years of work. I do a lot of work these days helping others um, to train their palates and be able to distinguish flavors and aromas. And I, in my very completely unscientific way, have always told people that if you like wine, that means your palate is good enough to develop it to the professional level. Because if you didn't have enough of a sense of taste or a sense of smell, then you wouldn't really care about wine and food. That would be boring. If you're interested in wine and food, if you love it, then you have a palate. Okay, completely unscientific, no graphs to back that up, nothing. <laughs> but that's what I've always believed, and that's what I've always told people, and they've believed me, um, and it's kind of worked. <laughs> okay. um, if you've ever seen the psalm, the documentary that's out in the past year called Psalm, that was kind of my life for many, many years. Um, practicing with a glass of wine, having no idea, I've never seen the bottle, never seen the label, getting every single um, aroma and flavor and structural component, levels of bitterness, levels of acidity, um, et cetera, that I could out of the wine until I used a deductive process and tried to figure out what that wine was. Did that two, three times a week for many, many years. Wrong a lot, but <laughs> I was right enough in the end um, to, develop that, um, to develop that sense and to be successful passing that part of the exam. And I realized along the way that we're not tested that way to torture us, although it might seem that way. But the idea is for us as wine professionals to be able to understand what's unique and interesting about each wine. Why one wine tastes completely different from another wine and how to communicate that to people who are sitting in tables in front of us. Right? And that's really also the key, um, not just for us to know, um, but for us to be able to tell you and help you choose the wine that you love. Because we always say all the time, everybody's palate is different. Again, no graphs, you know, no, um, no pictures, no graphics, but we always say that, and we know that we have to create wine lists that are really diverse, that have wines of all different styles, some with really ripe fruit, some that are really kind of bitter and dusty, and some in between, you know, some with all of like the vanilla and cinnamon and clove flavors that get picked up from new oak barrels, and some with none of that, some that taste more like licking a rock, all these different styles. <laughs> Because people like that sort of thing, or at least some of them. Um, and we put together a list with all of these possibilities. Luckily, my inventory doesn't go bad, or at least not very quickly. Not like a chef's inventory, where you have to sell it very fast. If I don't sell a wine for two weeks, that's OK. It's, it's the same or even better. Um, we ask a series of questions, basically, to determine what you like. We don't. Um, make you drink bad formula or <laughs> anything like that. <laughs> Although, maybe we will now. <laughs> maybe that's a good idea. Um, but we might ask what wines you like or what wines you've enjoyed in the past. Do you take your coffee black or with cream and sugar to kind of determine your, the level of bitterness you can tolerate? Um, do you like really floral perfume, um, et cetera, et cetera? Do you have a sweet tooth? 
et cetera, et cetera. Um, and some people are really kind of happy to play this game and others are a little less comfortable with it, which is why we kind of add in the questions about coffee and such. Uh, but most of the time, I'm happy to say, it ends up that we put the right wine in the right hands and everybody's happy. Right? Um, so that, in a nutshell, is my job and what I try to teach others. So um, if we have other people who uh, work with fragrances and with aromas and with flavors in very different ways. And I'm looking forward to the scientific approach and um, other approaches and to see what we have um, coming up. So I hope you are too. And I'm going to introduce our first um, next panelist, um, which is Susan Watterson. She is a local hero in these parts, another local girl. Uh, a chef who's been in this area for a long time, worked in a whole bunch of different types of restaurants and hotels and such, and now is also quite the teacher herself um, in a couple of different places, which, um, one of which is culinary, which teaches really fun classes up by Thomas Circle. Um, but I will let her introduce herself, so enjoy. Okay, tell me if, oh, it is on. Okay, good. <laughs> Hi, well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I, um I'm a chef, currently a chef instructor. I'm co-owner of Culinary, which is a cooking school around the corner on 14th Street. When I went to school back in 1991, I was taught by French chefs, old school French chefs. And when you would say, why, they'd say, because. And that's all the answer you ever got for anything. And over the course of teaching, I've been teaching for 20 years, I had, I've had students, I had a chemist who worked with the FDA, I've had physicists, I've had scientists who would say, why? And I was like, uh, uh, let me check Harold McGee. I'll get back to you in a second, because I didn't know. And so I got very interested in finding out the whys of cooking instead of just this goes with this or this doesn't go with this or whatever. So I've been really interested in the whole, in the whole taste and smell. Um, and the presentation that, that you gave was fantastic because it was a little more technical than I get. But um, of how that plays, in, plays into what you taste. And taste. Taste and smell, yes, there's a science to it. It's also subjective. Maybe you like grapefruit and tarragon together. Maybe you hate it. Um, some people love saffron. Some people hate it. But, and there are traditional taste pairings. For example, seafood, shellfish and fish, natural pairing with anise flavors. So tarragon, fennel, perneau, that kind of stuff. They're considered classical pairings. I get asked that all the time by students. How do I know what goes with what? I'm like, well, stick with the classics, and then you can investigate on your own. But I found the whole, uh, that whole functioning of how the taste and flavor thing works is really interesting. So I developed a taste and flavor class for, for my 12-week series where I do the same kind of thing. We have them hold their nose. And for bitter, we give them espresso, a combination of espresso, but they don't know what it is. And like, OK, put it on your tongue. What does it taste? It tastes bitter. OK, take, take your hands off your nose. Oh, it's coffee. And so I find this whole thing in my evolution of cooking, because there really is no ceiling on cooking. You could cook the rest of your life and still do different stuff all the time, which is what I've been trying to do for 20 years. But as a teacher, I find this all really, really interesting how the science plays into the actual, well, you know, I am a chef, and therefore I say that th these flavors go together. Um, I have my opinion. You probably have your opinion. You probably like a particular restaurant because you like what the chef likes. If, if they use, you like mushrooms and lemons and they use a lot of mushroom and lemon flavors in their dishes, you probably like them. So my current job as a chef instructor, and no, I'm not a chef in a restaurant anymore. I'll be working on a Saturday night and somebody will say, what restaurant do you work at? I'm like, ah, I wouldn't be here right now if I was still working at a restaurant. <laughs> I would be at the restaurant. Um, so I'm strictly a chef instructor right now, but I find this whole topic super interesting because it, in the development of people's palates, it's interesting to see how they react to certain things, what they like, what they don't like. And it's my job to kind of foster that. So that's what I'm doing right now. Great. Thank you, Susan. Joan, would you like to Certainly. tell us what you do? I, I would, yes. Um, is this working? I can hear you. Is it good? Can you hear Joan? OK, good. Uh, yes, you talk about uh, unscientific uh, stories. Uh, my, mine is an interesting one. Um, um, it was a, a summer internship uh, in the south of France uh, that my dad sent me to because uh, he didn't want me partying while I was learning to brush up on my French. And uh, I landed up at a uh, perfumery school in Grasse, France. 
And for uh, nearly three months, I smelled natural and synthetic essential oils. Um, and the, the way you learn how to smell uh, is you learn in categories. So you learn how to smell florals, and you learn to identify them if you can. And the same thing goes for you know, the citruses and the fruits, and the herbs and the woods and the musks. And uh, um, uh, then a a after that, so I think what's important about uh, learning how to smell is that it's really a, it's a memorization. Um, and uh, what you do when you smell, and you might do the same thing with wine, is when you need to learn to identify eight different kinds of roses or eight different kinds of grapes, sure. um, what you do is you associate the note with something, and you memorize the way that smells. Now, needless to say, you know, not everyone is interested in doing that. Um, I realized after what? I realized after <laughs> the ten, 10 days in, in the south of France that I was. So fortunately, I paid attention. Um, and uh, um, but you know, li like most people, um, I, I didn't realize uh, after I had this experience that it would essentially define 25 years uh, of my career. Uh, my uh, experience post college as an English major. Uh, was to work in a laboratory. Again, my father was protecting me, and he set me up with some friends in a laboratory in Manhattan. Um, and uh, while I was there, um, not having a, an inclination for science, I realized that I wasn't going to be a perfumer, because perfumers, those are the people that actually write the formulas to create the fragrance that we all smell and everything from your perfume. and and uh, fragrance to candle to all the laundry products that you use every day, and your shower gel and your shampoo, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what I landed up doing um, at the Fragrance House 25 years ago was working, um, uh, learning how to become the person who explains to the perfumer what it is the client is asking for. So let me, let me give you an example of, of what I mean by that. Um, so Estee Lauder came to us and said, we would like to develop a fragrance that's sensuous, but sensuous in a different way than youth do, um, and opium. We, we don't want it to be something that's really uh, kind of disturbing and you know, hard to wear. We want it to be something that when paneled, many, many, many people are going to like it and we'll sell 10 million bottles and it'll be a success story. Um, so what a fragrance evaluator does, which is what I was training to become, is, um, and this took 10 years to get right, I assure you, is um, study, essentially, the market and uh, study the, the competition to the client so that you can explain to the perfumer how the creation that they're attempting to work on for the, the brief, for the, for the client, um, can be better. Uh, essentially, you know, when you work with perfumers who are very much like artists and musicians, um, uh, you know, you, you really have to, um, you, know, you really have to earn their trust. Or why should, you know, a perfumer change their formula? I, and I know the exact same thing is true with flavorous. I'm sure you'd agree. Um, but uh, I think that the discovery in um, the potential for fragrance creativity as it relates to the industry, and you all know how big the industry is, because by the time you leave your house in the morning, you have probably smelled, what would you guess? Yeah. Trillions. Trillions. <laughs> Trillions. No pressure. Yeah. Um, but really, it was language. It was you know, an inclination for language. Um, in, in fact, it's, it's ironic. Um, you know, we, we talk about all kinds of things all the time, all day, blah, 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 blah. But we really don't actually talk about how a fragrance smells. Uh, I think one thing that's always interested, you know, been fascinating to me is, uh, you know, it's kind of like the, the silent sense, yet we know that from the time we're, we're children, um, 
that you know, we're smelling uh, and, and memorizing, and, and those experiences are our inclination <clears throat> to love hot cocoa and marshmallow and the softness of mommy's skin and you know, summertime in the ocean. Um, all of those values essentially are created when we're children. And I wonder if anyone in the audience uh, would know, um, in, a, in a survey, perhaps unscientific, but nevertheless, a lot of people, what is the most common scent that um, uh, a child will say um, you know, is like you know, their, their favorite scent? This is the scent that I really know and that I like. Crayons. Crayons. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Ab absolutely true. Um, there are wines that smell like crayons, too, and Play-Doh. So. And, and Play-Doh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but, but I always fi find it, you know, very, very fascinating, you know, I, question. You know, when was the last time you went up to a friend and said, oh, my God, you'll never believe what I smelled yesterday? <laughs> We, we just don't do it yet. We'll rec recount an amazing meal that we had in a restaurant, and we'll recount the brilliance of the, the concert that we went to, or the beautiful clothing that we saw in a store, um, or the amazing wine that we drank. But we, we really don't address scent uh, that way yet. Um, you know, the, the fragrance industry and, and the perfumers who create the fragrances um, and the people who decide what's going to be launched. Uh, it's a huge industry which, you know, borrows from all of our memories, as you mentioned earlier, and our imagination. Um, should I continue? I don't sure, know. Sure, I was where. just, um, I was um, just going to ask you a quick question uh, that relates to this a little bit, um, what you said about kind of vocalizing these fragrances that we remember. I've read that most perfumers are women the vast majority of perfumers are women, kind of the opposite of my profession, which is still very male dominated, even though that's changing quite a bit. I've been asked why there are few, so few female sommeliers over and over and over again. So I've thought about it and I've begun to suspect that it is because women are more comfortable putting a name to what it is they smell, not that women can, we can smell any better than anyone else. Do you, would you, does that sound right to you? Do you agree with that or? Um, I, I don't know that, uh, you know, I've observed that. Having been to uh, perfume I, school, I, yeah. you thought you may have seen Yeah, I think it's, I think it's very even myself personally. Mm -hmm. Do you have any insight into all the fragrance houses you might have been exposed to? I, I wouldn't, uh, I mean, wouldn't know. I, I, I've yeah. known both male and female perfumers. Right. So. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I no, really it's okay. Do, I mean, yeah. In my experience, I know so many men That's with great palettes, um, with sommeliers and chefs and other things. That uh, absolutely. I, I, I think one, one thing I agree with the, yeah. what, one the thing, common wisdom that women have better palettes. Yeah. One, one thing that I would say is that, you know, just historically, I mean, men, more men were working, I mean, perf perfumery is hundreds and hundreds of years old. And certainly men were m more than likely you know, doing most of the perfumery creation uh, years ago. So I, I guess what I would say is that there's probably more women the last 25 years mm. creating fragrances as perfumers than there were 50 years ago. I think that would be safe to say. C certainly research would suggest that women are more sensitive to smells. They're able to detect them at lower levels. They're able to name them better. Um, and uh, there's been some suggestion that, that may have something to do with the role of smell and sexual selection and all kinds of speculations on that. But it's pretty clear that, uh, much as I always hate to admit it, that uh, women are better in this score. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, and do you, is there a difference between being able to name the smell and being able to sense it, or is that the same thing? I think it's two different things. Two different things? Okay. Mm. All right. Interesting. Um, I have a kind of a little question for all of you, um, since we've talked about this a little bit. Um, how have you trained yourselves to kind of improve your sense of smell? Since I do believe this is something that most people, at least, can kind of work on and can improve. And you talked about that a little bit with repetition of smelling categories over and over again. Is there more that you've done to um, improve your, your sense of smell, and do you keep doing it? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think uh, 
<laughs> the, the platform for developing you know, ol your olfactive skills is smelling natural essential oils. But with the advent of technology and the creation of new molecules, synthetics play a huge role in uh, perfumery for all, uh, all products now. Uh, in fact, uh, synthetic uh, oils are less um, irritating than natural oils, uh, quite frequently um, not containing notes that are as spicy or camphoraceous, and, and they're really skin irritants. Uh, but I think that, um, you know, uh, I smell new molecules. You know, uh, I think if you, know, you think about some of the fruits and the flavors and the beverage market, which uh, fragrance is very, very much a cousin to the, to the flavor market, um, you know, there's all these new fruits that are really becoming very mainstream that, you know, we're talking about acai and dragon fruit and uh, Buddha. kind of Buddha and Pitanga and, and all of these really unusual. Um, so I so think you're constantly smelling new things. Constantly, to, constantly smelling new things and also, uh, you know, understanding adjacent categories such as flavor, food and wine. Great. Spirits is very important. Wonderful. Susan, you um, eating, eating. All right. I'm stop awesome. eating. <laughs> awesome. Well, but you, when you're when you're cooking, and you're not cooking for you, you're cooking, you know, for the you work for food. So your general populace has got to like what, what you're eating. And every time, we've we've mechanized and and uh, farm raised so many things. Like before I got here, I portioned out 68 pieces of salmon and every salmon filet had exactly nine portions to it, which scared the crap out of me. Cause I'm like, <laughs> how can they all be exactly the same size? But we haven't really been able to do that with like fruits and vegetables. So those are very random according to the season, according to what part of the country they come. So you have to taste constantly because I've gotten butternut squash in July that has a beautiful balance of acidity and sweetness, which is present in fruits and vegetables, and depending on their ripeness and whether they're a fruit or vegetable. Then I've had some in October when you really would have expected that like a butternut squash would be more in season and better flavored that tasted like absolutely nothing. So you have to constant, you can't just say, oh, I have two pounds of butternut squash, so therefore I need this much stock and this much salt and this much whatever. I don't know how that vegetable or fruit is going to taste. So you constantly taste things as you go. And when you taste it, you go, this doesn't taste like the one I made last month. Why not? Oh, it's not as bright. Well, what does that mean? I'm not tasting the same things. Well, what were the things? Well, the other one was like tangy and kind of sweet. OK, well, then I have to make up for that. Like maybe I'll put some honey or I'll finish it with some vinegar or something like that to bring those flavors back in. But you do that all day, every day. You know, you're just constantly tasting stuff as you go. So you, I think you train your palate by just exposure, exposure, exposure. Sort of the same thing you do in a more methodical way than I do it in a random way. OK. Well, that's, it works, though, right? <laughs> <go>. Hopefully. <laughs> uh, I don't know you're mostly on the research side, but I know you are concerned about your own um, sense of smell. So I, I, read a, I read a story about you getting a, 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 a lily, a certain type of lily, because it was very pungent to make sure your sense of smell was still there. So are there things that you Star do to keep up? Lily. A stargazer lily. Yes, okay. right. Um, well, actually, it, it, just to switch a little bit, I, I'll, I can come back to that. But um, you know, this is about neuroscience, supposedly, or something to do with neuroscience. So uh, I think some of the issues that you raise uh, and you, you too, uh, really are speaking to the neuroscience of olfaction, where, where as I said, uh, this is a sense that really bypasses the thalamus, it goes directly to the old parts of the brain. Um, and, and we have, most people, unlike you and you, don't have words for smells. Everything we say, it smells like. It right. smells like X, it smells like Y, it smells like Z. And only these professionals have created a vocabulary where they can uh, sort of talk to each other. Um, and, and I think we don't, dis we don't say we had a great smell the day before <laughs> because you know, we smelled <laughs> apple or we smelled cherry or we smelled our wife or, or, or our child or whatever. Um, to me, that last one is the best smell. But, uh, but, but um, we really don't have words for smell, and, and it, it, it takes somebody who's got this training to attach the words to it, and I think that's the most important thing. I, I think a lot of training is not becoming better at it in some way, or you know, if I objectively measure how good you are at smelling things, um, I mean, I'm sure you're good, but I'm, I'm not sure you're any better than half the people in the audience. But what you can do is you can name them, and you can tell what, when you put them together, and there's this famous story, you can tell me whether this is, I mean, I'm making this up, but of a perfumer 
who, um, who retired from perfumery and went to live on a South Sea island. Uh, but he was still so good that they would send him the, 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 the what's it, what do you call it when the, the company gives you a, a, an order for a kind of perfume? Oh, uh, a fragrance brief. A fragrance brief. So they would send it to him on this island, and in his head, he would create the perfume. Mm. A, and and he, could, he knew what the odors were to work with the palate, and he knew how they went together, and he didn't have to smell them at all, because he, 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 he had this experience in this, this ability to, to remember and to name. And um, I think what I don't have is an ability to name, frankly. Uh, we did a study years and years ago where we asked people to identify smells absolutely, just based on the smell. And they're unbelievably bad at this. Um, <laughs> and you're talking about crayon odor. Uh, uh, we, we then used a bunch of real things and put them in jars and had people smell them. And even for crayons, although people were pretty good at that, Many people would say, this smells like school, it smells like uh, something, it smells like something. And you know, they couldn't quite get it. It's, it's been called the tip of the nose phenomenon, that, that you, 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 you recognize it, you know whether you like it, but you cannot name it to save your life. Um, and th that's, I think, really makes smell very different than colors or sounds or things of that sort. But have you noticed a connection between the sense of smell and visualization or any other kind of form of creativity, because saying it smells like school is kind of, I, I find that close to the smell of crayon, I think. Yes. I think they're almost there. I'm sure. Well, they are, they're, 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 they're there. They they're, smell them. Yeah, and they just, they just can't quite get their, get their hands right. on it. Right, but they're kind of back there in the experience, so that's interesting. Have you noticed that in your work at all, Susan or Joan? Any, do you visualize Well, I tell my you? students they have to develop taste buds in their head. Because okay. you can't figure out what goes with what if you don't know what it is. So if, if I said to you right now, taste prune, taste lentils, put them together, sound like a good idea? Probably not. Now there may be some of you that went, I think that sounds fantastic. <laughs> but for most people, they'd be like sweet, sticky, earthy, just, you know, it wouldn't, so the, the best way to become a good cook is after a while you just know in your head how something tastes and you can go, this, like the, the parfumier, you like, this plus this, maybe this plus this, no. And you just kind of get used to that with time. I would, yeah, I would definitely, um, with food and wine pairing, I do the same thing. I would definitely do you do that also. Yeah, I, I think visual, visualization is, is very key as it relates to fragrance and again, my, my orientation is definitely commercial, not scientific. Um, you know, I think, just imagine looking at a beautiful pink rose. Now, just imagine if that rose was chartreuse. Would you expect that rose to smell like the pink rose? Definitely not. And if it was blue, you'd probably think that it smelled more like the sky or, or the water. So, you know, I think what really sells fragrance, naturally, you, you have to like the fragrance once you get it home and you experience it. But the ad, you know, the, the choice of, of color and language is undoubtedly what closes the, the deal and creates, creates loyalty Good. to that fragrance. Great. Thank you very much. I think we're going to take yes, some let's, questions. Yes, let's uh, open it up to the audience. There are microphones on both sides. Don't be shy. Uh, and uh, please, if you're, in the, if you're directing the question to somebody in particular, please identify them immediately so they'll begin thinking. And please identify yourself with affiliation. Please. Hi, my name is Heather Dean. I'm a neuroscientist by training. I'm a AAAS policy fellow at the National Science Foundation right now. So the, the importance of early experience has come up many times. And so I'm interested in critical periods. We all know about acquired tastes. I know the first time my husband and I tried uh, grasshopper tacos, we, we were totally turned off, but when we had grasshoppers recently in Oaxaca, they actually weren't bad. Is there something important about the taste that we have when we're very, very young, or can these uh, can still tastes and, and, and um, preferences for smells be acquired in the same way later on? Is there a critical period? I believe there's a critical period, yes. Uh, but I also know that we are omnivorous, and therefore we have to be able to be open to new foods uh, all, all our lives. And I, I, I myself never had sashimi until I was uh, an adult, but I loved it. So um, I think the fact that there's critical periods doesn't imply that you can't 
learn new things later on. But I think that there is this special sensitivity, the special period, which looks like it's around the first few months of life. Okay, over here on the right, please. Yeah. My name is Bill Fitzsimmons, I'm not affiliated. I read an article about a year ago saying that with the changes in the American population, more Hispanics and so on, the sale of hot sauces and other kinds of spicy foods has gone up. And my question is whether there's some cultural shifts going on in how we taste and smell things. Anybody on the panel want to react to that? I think it's just new exposure. We never had it. I know I, I moved to Texas from Connecticut when I was in, in uh, high school. I'd never had salsa before because you just didn't have it when I was a kid growing up in Connecticut. By the time we left, we had, you know, like Pete's hot sauce on the table, table and salsa all the time. I think it's just, it's an acquired taste. Like some people tasted it and went, eh. Other people tasted it and went, wow, this is fantastic. Other people got used to it over time and it just gets inculcated into, I do think there are specific regions that like, 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 chill, like supposedly babies are uh, partial to sweet. That's, that's a flavor they like the best. I know that in Asian countries, they tend to like bitter a lot better than Americans do. So I do think there are geographical preferences, but I think as the globe gets smaller and smaller and we get introduced to different foods and exposed to them, we start to open our palates up to things that we normally never would have experienced or liked. And so many chefs are mixing cuisines also and modern menus have a little of everything. So maybe that's another way to be exposed to. That could be it. Okay, over here, please. Hi, I'm Ling Wong. I'm a postdoc at the VA hospital. And you guys inspired me to think back to a couple years ago when I was working at UPenn in the hospital and I would see this billboard with, you know, advertisements or research studies. And there were always some that I loved. It was sign up to get free snacks for a month and you just, you know, evaluate the taste and smell of these. But I was always bummed because these studies were only for men. And eventually, you know, you started reading in the news that it's because women are more sensitive and maybe their smells change over their cycle. Can you, maybe this question is for the whole panel, can you talk a little bit more about how our sensitivity or maybe preferences for different kinds of smells changes over the cycle and maybe how also hormonal birth, birth control can affect that? Well, what one thing I'll just say, since you're from Penn, you probably saw some of our signs. We do not discriminate against women in our studies. <laughs> And in fact, we do more women than we do men because we're particularly interested in mothers. So, so uh, uh, that, that, that's definitely true. And the, the changes in, in, uh, across the menstrual cycle uh, are real but small and uh, really not very significant. Um, uh, and and uh, so, you know, I, I, I don't think that that's, I mean, I, I'm really surprised that they only, they're only doing men in, in part because men are, are really terrible and they don't pay any attention at all and they just <laughs> The difference between dogs and cats, the, 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 the men and the dogs, they just, you know, have, have pay no, no sense at all, but, um, okay. so, I've <laughs> not a serious nothing answer, to sorry. Add to that. <laughs> I'm just glad you said that, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, how about over here, please? Yes, um, I, my name is Olga Cabello, I'm with the State Department, um, and I have actually two questions. One is following up on the question of gender, and that is, are there any examples of genetic differences between males and females in terms of olfactory um, receptors or isozymes. And then my second question is, can you, spe can you um, speculate on the uh, evolutionary basis of uh, olfactory perception of synthetics? Okay. That sounds like one for you too. <laughs> I could try the first one. Um, the, 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 there are a couple of interesting differences. Um, and, and one that um, I, I don't think we really totally understand is that we've been talking about experience and how you can get better with practice. And at least there's a couple of studies suggesting that women are much more able to do that than men. Th that is, by, uh, by exposing themselves to very low levels of an odor, they become sensitized to it and can detect it at lower and lower concentrations, whereas males appear not to be able to. This trait goes away after menopause, seems to develop during uh, 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 maturation, and so it seems to be involved in, in, in uh, sex hormones, um, but the mechanism is not clear whether it's receptors or whether it's something else further in the brain, uh, I don't think anybody knows. 
The second question I don't have any answer to. Sorry. Joan, do you want to give it a yes. crack with the synthetics? Yes, yeah. you, you were asking about uh, synthetic fragrances. Any synthetic odorant, because evolutionarily you would assume that only natural substance, substances that have existed in nature forever uh, would be perceived. So what is the, the, the physiological basis of mm -hmm. our capacity to, per to perceive a synthetic? I, I'm really not sure. Uh, <laughs> a, 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 actually, the only thing that I understand uh, uh, about synthetic materials is that they're much more stable chemically, number one. Uh, and number two, nature is nature and never per perfect. But when um, the chemists are creating molecules to create uh, you know, synth synth synthetic copies, if you will, of what occurs in nature, they can actually make it better by adding things that have nothing to do with it. For example, a strawberry, a synthetic strawberry um, uh, chemicals actually contain a little bit of acetates, which are a little bit of pear and a little bit of apple to make the strawberry smell even more delicious. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a little tricky. It's an insincere way to create something that's a little bit more perfect than nature. Do you want to add anything well, here? I, I, I mean, that's a really good question. Uh, it, well, one I puzzle about as well. I mean, I think that, say, for olfactory receptors, that there's so many of them that they kind of cover the, the universe of what a molecule's shape might be. And so a new molecule uh, will fit into some receptor um, because there's such a wide variety of them. Uh, and you think about taste, there's a lot of, uh, say, artificial sweeteners. Um, <clears throat> it turns out that you know, some of those are novel compounds. They don't exist in nature. And, and um, they have somehow, they, they tweak the sweet receptor, actually not necessarily in the same place that sugar does. They, they, they seem to interact with it somewhere else. So again, the, 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 this I think is sort of by chance uh, for, for the taste. But for smell, I think that, that, that there's enough of them that they can get a pretty much of the universe of, of what a molecule might, the shape of the molecule might be. Okay, over here, please. Um, hi, I'm Nicole Bennett I'm from the National Science Foundation. I'm an organic chemist. I want to thank you for giving me some ammunition for my husband the next time he tries to make me eat broccoli, which I <laughs> <laughs> abhor the smell and taste of. Um, I have a question that's a little on the, well, a nutty side. But um, when I, I'm a bibliophile, I love to read. And when I read certain authors, I start to salivate and I will taste and smell certain things. So for example, if I read something by Charles Dickens, I'll get a very strong taste of chocolate. Actually, I'm salivating as I'm asking the question. <laughs> and I wonder if there's some um, understanding of not just how taste and smell interact, but how they interact with other things that you might do that maybe have nothing to do with um, eating or getting that aroma. Well, not being a scientist, what I would say is that you probably have an amazing imagination. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of any. Do you have anything to add? To yes, that? yes, we want to sign you up as an ex experimental subject. <laughs> Thank you. I think you stumped the panelists. Yeah. Okay, we have time for a few more. Please, maybe we'll try to get through the four that are up. Please, sir. Hi, my name is Frank Rettenberg. Um, I recall reading uh, <clears throat> in the popular press that uh, humans could be divided into three categories of low tasters, medium tasters, and high tasters, where low tasters would be happy eating Purina human chow for the rest of their <laughs> lives. Uh, high tasters are your extremely picky eaters, and medium tasters are your more adventurous, will try anything. Um, I was just wondering if there was any truth to that. <laughs> well, there's a little truth to everything, but only a little. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I could I mean, talk well, about that I for about that I could do about half an hour on that, but um, the, the original idea was that this PTC stuff that I talked about, that the, the people divided up into the very sensitive, in between, and less sensitive. And they, those were originally called the super tasters and the, not, and the regular tasters. That's expanded to, to include everything, including what you said and maybe even what, what color clothes they wear. Um, and 
In my view, there's very little evidence for, for, for that. There's, there's obviously big differences with, with those receptors that I talked about. That actually goes into other things as well for reasons that we're not clear about. But you could be really, really sensitive to, say, that bitter compound and have absolutely no sensitivity for something else. So uh, I, I don't think it's anywhere near as expansive as you made it out to be. All right, thank you. Please, over there. Hi, um, my name's Emily Underwood. I, I'm the neuroscience reporter for, for the news section of science. And I, um, something I didn't hear come up, I mean, smell and taste and mood are so linked. Um, and we often, when you talk about depression or a number of other mood disorders, people describe their senses being deadened. Um, is, is that something you know much about? I mean, is there research going on into why that might be? We also talk about things like aromatherapy. Um, is that real? I, I mean, as far as mood goes, I mean, I've been in situations where people have tasted one wine when they were in a bad mood and tasted the same wine, you know, and hated it, tasted the same wine and then when they were in a good mood, you know, a month later and loved it. So, I mean, there must be some, that's completely unscientific, I understand, but there must be something to it. Maybe you know more. Well, I, I mean, I, I, obviously, the, the, again, the neuroscience would suggest that the olfactory system is going directly to these emotional mood parts of the brain. Um, so there, you know, there, there's definitely evidence that you can alter mood by smells and that, that smells uh, um, can alter mood. Um, there's some interesting stuff going on in our place, actually, looking at uh, the role that odors might play, particularly body odors, in uh, reaching uh, into and engaging uh, kids with autism, uh, where you, the, the auditory and the visual is, is, is a problem. Uh, and maybe smell is, again, sort of bypassing some of these things and getting into the, that, that more, more emotional part, part of the uh, of the child, and I think that, I mean, I'm very excited about that work, it's just really in the infancy, but I think that might be a very practical kind of thing coming from this. Thanks. And over here, please. Hi, uh, Libby O'Hare with the National Academy of Sciences. Thank you for a really, really interesting um, seminar. So um, one of the things that Susan had mentioned was that um, for chefs, at least, or in her experience, at least, she makes things that she likes to taste. You're always kind of tasting as you go. Um, this topic is really interesting, I think, because it's where chemistry and biology kind of meet subjectiveness and preference. So for Catherine and Joan, how hard is it to know, I guess maybe especially for wine, that the wine is kind of objectively a good wine when you don't have a personal preference for it? You might pr prefer a different kind of, of wine or, or maybe you're trying to work on a fragrance that you think smells horrible, but yet, you know, do you know what I'm getting at? So I don't know yeah. if you have any thoughts I mean, on that. I choose wines for my list and recommend wines to people that are not my perfect personal preference all the time. Probably more often than I would recommend something that is my personal preference. Because like I mentioned, I like things that taste like lemon on a rock and are really bitter and dusty. <laughs> Most people don't. I'm the outlier. Okay? Um, it's a sense of balance, um, very similar to putting a, a dish together and making sure that you know that butternut squash, butternut squash, if it's not ripe enough, um, add some sugar to kind of bring out some flavors. It's a sense of balance and components between you know the fruit not being overshadowed by the acidity or the tannin. Everything, um, all of the components are kind of at an equal level instead of one outshining the other. Um, length of finish, how long the flavors last on the palate is basically. Um, the, the most we have in objective determination of whether a wine is good or not, and also kind of personal experience, tasting wines in groups of people and seeing what types of wines most people do like. Kind of putting both of those together for me. I don't know. Joan, did you have yeah, anything? Yeah, from my perspective, um, when you're creating fragrance, um, how I feel about the fragrance is not the mission. The mission is to understand the audience that the customer wishes to design the fragrance for. So I think the best way to think about it is to, to compartmentalize fragrance. So the, the limited distribution, high-end, or very niche brand fragrances are meant to really, really get your attention with newness, innovation, and shock value is okay. 
<laughs> the broad distribution, you know, 2,200 stores, you know, uh, uh, companies spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to make sure that the top box score, if there are five boxes, that the top box score is going to get, you know, 40% and that the top two boxes are going to get 70. So 70% 70 of people will open up their wallet and say, I'm buying that. You know, so when you understand who the audience is and, and uh, that, that really is, is how, um, you know, you, you evolve a fragrance to the point that you, you're willing to submit it to the customer. And I, I prefer to like it, but it's also pretty exciting not to like it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Last question, please. Okay. Hi, I'm Jane Prey from the National Science Foundation, and I, this question is more towards Susan. And I totally relate to you when you said, when you read something, you can kind of see how it's going to taste. I bake a lot. And so my question to you is, I've spent lots and lots of money buying really high-level vanillas, whether you buy the Madagascar and the Mexican and the whatever. Am I wasting my money? Should I just buy the, <laughs> the, the imitation vanilla now that we can do it so well? Well, especially in pastry, because vanilla is going to be like one of the major flavor components outside yeah. of like butter. Mm -hmm. Probably the best vanilla in the world comes from La Réunion, which is an island. Um, it's going to be expensive, but it will make a difference. Madagascar vanillas are also good. Mexican vanillas are not considered of the same quality mm -hmm. or of the same right. aroma and essence. So if you're doing something like a butter cookie, where the vanilla is like front and center. Mm -hmm. Save your good vanilla for that. If it's going into a chocolate chip cookie, you can use your, your lesser quality because mm -hmm. the chocolate chips are taken front stage and the vanilla is not. So I would say get, you know, get a small bottle of Nielsen Massey and use mm -hmm. that for when vanilla is really the star. And use the, use the it's like using extra virgin olive oil ver versus a, a lesser press. Mm -hmm. Save the good stuff for where you can really taste the good stuff mm -hmm. and then use the less expensive stuff for places where it so doesn't count So it really does make a difference to the common, common palate. If I'm well, it's like the difference between sea salt and regular salt. If you sprinkle it on top of focaccia, you're going to be able to tell the difference between uh, the little girl in the raincoat that pours and, yeah. you know, yeah. La Baleine. <laughs> but if you're putting it in a, in a beef stew, you're, never, you're not going to be able to tell the difference. So if, you, if it's, vanilla is really the thing that you're tasting, you use a good quality vanilla. For everything else, you can use cheaper vanilla.